Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. And I think some people get hung up on, well, is Jesus is the only way. Listen, don't get hung up on the fact that Jesus is the only way. Be thankful that there is a way. A person's highest created purpose is to know God and to walk with God and to fellowship with God and submit their hearts to God. It's what they're made for. It's what I'm made for. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hi there, I'm Bayless Conley. So glad to have you with us today. And we're exploring some of the answers from Scripture that will help us draw close to God in our relationship with Him. Did you know that God wants to use you? There's people around us every day that are in need of new spiritual life. And frankly, we are God's vessels. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. I think you're going to be surprised with what we explore. So if you have a Bible, if you would open, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12, and we want to begin at verse 54. Jesus has been speaking to his disciples, but apparently there is a large crowd of other people around him, and he begins to speak to them as well. Verse 54, it says, Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? They were good at discerning the outward with their physical eyes and their senses, but they were too calloused to discern the inward with the eyes of their spirit. They were weather-wise. They understood the signs of the weather of the sky and the earth, but they were not wise concerning the kingdom of God, nor concerning the time in which they were living. You see, they did not discern the wind of the Spirit blowing over their lives. They didn't discern that a cloud of blessing had arisen with the coming of Christ and it would pour showers of mercy down into people's lives. We go on in verse 57. Jesus continues and is very much connected to what he just said. He said, yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, Make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. Jesus, again, using a natural understanding with them, he says, listen, when you've wronged someone, you discern the, the time and opportunity you have, you, you do all you can and you act while the opportunity's there to make things right and to settle with that person and to make peace with them lest things progress and you end up in judgment. So I said, even with a natural thing like that, you, you discern the right time. You have a window of opportunity while this thing is proceeding to judgment to work things out with a person that you have offended. Jesus' point is that it is time to get right with God and you have all sinned against him. Don't you discern the time that it's a time right now of grace and opportunity. The Savior is here. Repent and turn to him before judgment comes. And then we come to chapter 13 and verse 1. He says there, were pre- it says there were present at that season. That literally means at that very moment, at that time. We're going to find that some people in the crowd that he was talking to interrupted him with a bit of news. So there were present at that season or at that very time some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
And what they're saying to Jesus is, look, Jesus, we're not as undiscerning as you make us out to be. We know that the, the judgment in the story you just told us, the illustration, that, that that refers to God and his judgment and that, you know, you're telling us that, that we, we need to do some things, but, but we're not so undiscerning. We, we know a little bit about the judgment of God. We have seen the judgment of God working. And then they cited these Galileans that Pilate had killed as they were offering sacrifices and their blood was mingled with the sacrifices. And they assumed that God had judged these Galileans using Pilate as his device or as his tool, as his instrument to bring judgment upon these particular Galileans. Now, I'm quite sure that those that interrupted Jesus with this bit of news and what they thought was real insight about the character and workings of God, I'm quite sure they would have been Judeans. The Judeans looked down upon the Galileans. They despised them. They would have had no sympathy for them whatsoever. And so probably with a, a smug outlook said, look, we know God. We, we recognize God. You're talking about judgment. God judged those Galileans by sending Pilate to kill them. Jesus responds, look at verse 2. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. Everyone say no. no. I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus said, no, God doesn't work that way. Verse 4, or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Uh, Jesus said, listen, that wasn't God's judgment with the Galileans. And then he brought something right to their own backyard. Hey, when all of those Judeans were killed, when the tower collapsed and fell on them, you think that was God judging them because they were worse sinners than all, everybody else in Jerusalem? Jesus said, no, that was not the case. You see, life is fragile and we live in a fallen world. And we need to get right with God while the opportunity exists. Before things run all the way to judgment. You don't want to go to judgment without having made peace with God. And then Jesus shares a parable that's very much connected with the conversation that's gone on before in verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Right now, like the fig tree, a period of grace has been granted, a period of mercy and opportunity. And I'm sure that as Jesus was speaking to these Jews and he shares this parable, all of them would have probably thought about Amos, the Old Testament prophet. Amos, among other things, was the keeper of fig trees. And God used him. He actually stood in the gap for Israel as an intercessor. And he pleaded with God, God, give them more time. And God relented of his judgment and gave them more time to repent and to get right. And it's interesting that during Amos' day, Israel was at its pinnacle economically. Man, they were firing on all cylinders. They were, get, they were getting more land. They were getting more influence. They were prospering more and more. But underneath, it was rotten. Underneath, they had turned to God. And Amos came, this, this you know, keeper of fig trees. He came, you know, and, and he pleaded with God, God, relent, give them another chance, have mercy. And God said, okay, I will give them more time to repent, more time to make things right. 
But you know, as we see in the story, if there is no repentance, if there is no turning to God, if there are no fruits of salvation coming forth, eventually the acts of judgment will fall. But the fact is, God doesn't want anyone, anyone to perish. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we all know John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but they would have everlasting life. And this fig tree in the parable represents people. It represents you. It represents me. Headed for destruction, but then something happened. Grace and mercy were shown to it. And there's several important lessons as I read this parable in particular in the context of the greater story that really stand out to me. The first lesson is this. God is patient. God, in this parable, he is the owner of the vineyard. He is the owner of the fig tree, and he's incredibly patient. In the parable, this guy waits years. The owner waits years for this fig tree to produce fruit, and then he extends his patience even further and gives it more time. And you know, God deals with some people for years and years and years trying to get them to repent and to turn from their sin and to turn from trusting their own good works and their own self-righteousness to merit heaven and to get them to put their trust in Christ alone. And God is patient, patient, patient. But you know, part of Jesus' point was that though God is patient, Sometimes in this world, people fall prey to wicked acts of someone like Pilate or to natural disasters like those on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. And they don't have all the time that they thought they would have, even though God is extremely patient. Because we live in a broken world and everything doesn't function the way that God originally created it to function. And there is evil in the world. Right now, we are in a season of grace and opportunity to repent and to make our peace with God. Even as it says in Romans 2.4, God has been kind to you. He's been very patient, waiting for you to change. But you think nothing of his kindness. Maybe you don't understand that God is kind to you so that you will decide to change your lives. Now, First thought is that God is patient. The second one, second lesson is this. Someone needs to get involved. In this story, it was the keeper of the vineyard that actually got involved. And I see three things here with his involvement. Number one is personal responsibility. We need to become aware of our personal responsibility. Would you tap someone on the shoulder and say, I think he's talking about you right now. Yeah. I think he's talking about you. Once we get saved, in a way, we are like the keeper of the vineyard. You know, when God asked Cain, where's your brother Abel? Abel's, I mean, Cain said, well, am I my brother's keeper? Well, in a way, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Somebody says, oh, wait a minute. We pay the preacher for that. Let him do it. (laughs) No, we actually all as believers share in the responsibility and the high privilege of helping reach people for Christ. Every one of us. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. It's all from God. He brought us back to himself through Christ's death on the cross. And he has given to us the task of bringing others back to him through Christ. God was bringing the world back to himself through Christ. He did not hold people's sins against them. God has trusted us with the message that people may be brought back to him. So we are Christ's official messengers. 
It is, as, it is as if God is making his appeal through us. Here's what Christ wants us to beg you to do. Come back to God. You know, if I saw someone drowning, I wouldn't say, well, it's not my responsibility. Truthfully, every one of us have been rescued from the penalty of sin, which automatically incorporates us all into God's great plan of rescuing others. And it's not some heavy burden that we have to carry. It's not some mantle of guilt. It's actually exciting that God wants us to co-labor together with him. So first, we need to become aware of our personal responsibility, all of us as followers of Christ. And secondly, second thing I see is prayer. You know, the keeper of the vineyard talked to the owner about the fruitless tree. Talking to the owner, that's prayer. He talked to him. Supernatural things happen when we pray. We looked at it last week, Philippians 1 and 19. Paul said, through your prayers, God will send a supply of the Holy Spirit. Things happen when people pray. Listen, this is something that happens often, and I'm not exaggerating when I say often. In fact, this happened two times in the last 10 days, and I can tell you time after time after time it happens. Someone will come up and say, man, this is blowing my mind. Everything we talked about in the car on the way to church got addressed in the sermon today. <laughs> like, wow. People say, man, we, we were arguing about this at breakfast, and, and it, then it came out in the message. It's like God was speaking directly to me. That's because people pray. Now, here's something that doesn't happen all the time, but this does happen occasionally. Someone will come up with a friend and say, hey, you know, this is my very first time at your church today, and my friend brought me, and I just want to confirm, they talked to you, right? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they told you what to say, right? And I'm like, well, actually, I haven't met your friend yet. And their friend's going, I told you, I told you, I told you I didn't talk to him. Now, they hadn't been talking to me, but they had been talking to the owner. And so God uses that to read someone's mail. Friend, that is a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit, but it comes because people pray. You know, the night I ended up in the mission, the, the, the evening before, I'd been laying across the hood of my pickup truck, yelling at God, questions, struggles I was having, obstacles to me believing, like, what about this, what about that? I end up in the street mission the next night, and they're having testimonies, and every person that got up quoted the questions I'd shouted at God, I'd asked God, and then shared the answer from the Bible. Now, I tell you, I know why that happened, because people had been praying for me. They'd been talking to the owner about this fruitless fig tree. Even some of the people that I had recently rebuffed, I know, had been praying for me. I remember there was this guy, his name was Dana, and we were, you know, talking, and he was one of the first Christians I'd met. And uh, he tells me Jesus is the only way, and I sharply disagreed with him. I mean, I rebuffed him. You're like, you, you narrow-minded, bigoted, person. But Dana prayed for me. And because people prayed for me, the Holy Spirit worked in my life. And so yes, there's the, the awareness and the embracing of our personal responsibility. But then secondly, we need to talk to God about men. And then here's the third thing I see, and that is personal involvement. Notice that the keeper of the vineyard said, I will dig around the tree. I will fertilize it. I'm going to be involved personally. Yes, he talked to the owner, but after he spoke to the owner about the tree, he got involved. And I think that after we talk to God, we need to be prepared to be led to do more. And it shouldn't be a prayer, Lord, here I am. Send my brother. <laughs> Here I am. Send her. Lord, I'll do anything you want, as long as it's not hard or inconvenient or embarrassing or as long as it doesn't take me out of my comfort zone. 
And the truth is, God may take us way out of our comfort zone. I mean, he may prompt you and say, hey, you see that person over there? You mean that, that stranger? Yeah. Why don't you go introduce yourself and tell her your story? And go tell this person about Jesus. And we need to be prepared to obey when we have that kind of impression. But, but truthfully, I think most of the promptings that the Holy Spirit gives us when it comes to interacting with others and personal involvement are well within the scope of our abilities and of our personal experience. I don't think most of the time when God's prompting us that it's miles outside of our comfort zone. It can be something as simple as offering a no-strings-attached gift or act of kindness. That can be digging around the roots of the tree and fertilizing, trying to prompt it, to spur it on to produce fruit for God. As simple as saying, hey, I'd like to babysit your kids for free so you and your wife, you and your husband can go out and have a night by yourselves without the kids. Or carrying somebody's groceries in. Now I want you to think about this. In the parable and in life, the fig tree's purpose was to produce fruit. The owner nor the keeper were trying to force it to do something it wasn't made for. And we, human beings, were created to fellowship with God, to respond to God, to walk with God, to submit to God. And fertilizing and digging around the roots of the tree, which represents our prayers, our sharing, our acts of kindness, they are not coercive by nature. They are a means of helping people act according to their created purpose. We're not trying to get force people into our way or to try and get them to do something they were not meant to do. A person's highest created purpose is to know God and to walk with God and to fellowship with God and submit their hearts to God. It's what they're made for. It's what I'm made for. Just like the fig tree, it's made to produce figs. They weren't trying to force it to do something it wasn't made to do. And if we take the metaphor even a little further here, you know, as long as the tree was in the soil, it had hope. But once it was removed from the earth, all hope ended. While we are here in our earthly bodies, there's still hope to produce fruit for God, to repent and to be made right. But the time will ultimately come when Jesus, the great intercessor himself, will say, time's up. They will not change. Let every opportunity for repentance be removed. Even as the keeper of the vineyard said, if it doesn't produce fruit after that, fine. Then cut it down. Now, at this juncture in Jesus' ministry, he's actually headed to Jerusalem to be put into the hands of Pontius Pilate. Not where his blood will be mingled with the blood of the sacrifices, but where his blood will become the final sacrifice for the sin of mankind. And you know, the tower fell on those people and the stroke of God's judgment is gonna fall upon Jesus Christ as he hangs on Calvary's tree and becomes our substitute and our sin sacrifice. And I think some people get hung up on, what's this, Jesus is the only way. Listen, don't get hung up on the fact that Jesus is the only way. Be thankful that there is a way and that God has revealed that way and the way is available. And right now, let's be discerning about the time we're living in. It's a time of opportunity, a time of grace, a time where God's patience has been extended for us, a time where the cloud of God's blessing and the rain of God's mercy and the wind of his spirit is blowing a time where we can be made right with God because the truth is we do live in a fragile world. We live in a broken world, a world that's full of evil and one day God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth and things are going to function the way that he's designed them to function. But in the meantime, we we shouldn't blame the evil that the Pontius Pilots do or the natural disasters and tragedies like the tower falling. We shouldn't blame those on God. Jesus gave an affirmative 
No, a resounding no, that's not God that did that. Here's how God works. God is patient. And God inspires people to, to dig and to fertilize and to prompt. And he uses them and he extends his patience even further. But the truth is we may not have as long as we think to respond. I think that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. What a merciful God we serve. What an incredible God who's called us to join with him in this great task, this great work of reaching others for him and helping them to come back to God, their creator. I just for a moment, if you wouldn't mind, maybe bow your heads. I want to invite you to pray with me. Today, I'm just going to ask you to pray. I'm not going to ask anybody to lift a hand or to stand. But I know that the Holy Spirit is working. I don't believe it's coincidental that you have come into this place today or that you're watching via live stream or through some television program at some point in the future from where we are right now. Listen, the Holy Spirit is there with you. This is your time of opportunity. This is your day of salvation. Yes, the God of heaven knows your name and he loves you and he wants you to know him. So today, if you know, if you have a sense, however, that, that God is working, maybe something that somebody said to you recently, maybe something in the message today, maybe something you felt in the atmosphere in this place, I don't know. But I know you wouldn't be here. I know you wouldn't be listening to me right now, wherever you are, if God wasn't working in your life. I want to invite you to pray with me right now, a simple prayer. I can give you the words, but that's it. But if you'll tie your heart around these words and sincerely speak them to God, he'll hear you and he'll meet you. Let's pray. Let's talk to God out loud. Say, oh God, I come to you. With all of my heart, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. That he died to take away my sin. And that he was raised from the dead. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From this moment forward, Jesus, I will follow you. Well, I hope that you were encouraged by the broadcast today. And I just want to encourage you, keep your heart open for an opportunity to share, to, to put the gospel in work clothes, to, to display the love of Christ through some act of kindness to a coworker, to a neighbor. Listen, if you in your heart will say, God, show me someone. God will put some across, someone across your pathway that you can pour the love of God into their life. Get ready for it. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.